In this video, I'm actually going to derive the electromagnetic wave equation from Maxwell's equations in free space. So there's actually another video in this playlist where we talk about Maxwell's equations in free space and how they're different from Maxwell's equations in general. So let's have a quick little refresher. This row over here is Maxwell's equations in free space. So that is a vacuum. And a vacuum doesn't have any charges, and because there's no charges, there's no currents. So that means we have to modify Maxwell's equations just a little bit and do some tweaks that actually simplify the equations. So you might notice initially over here we've got a zero. Usually we have a rho over epsilon naught. But there's no charge density because the charge density is zero, so that means the divergence of the electric field is zero. So in free space, the divergence of both the electric and the magnetic fields uh, is zero. What about the curl? Well, Faraday's law of induction, it's still the same because there's no charge terms uh, and there's no current terms either. What about Ampere's law? Well, this is Ampere's modified law or Ampere's circuital law. So the curl of the magnetic field does not have a dependence on the current because there is no current. So we've taken that term out. So there's no term with the current, uh, which is in vector form represented as the vector j. And j is the electric current density vector. So that's not there. Also, I've chosen to write 1 on c squared instead of mu naught epsilon naught because this is actually going to become more intuitive when we get down to the bottom of the derivation. So this over here is exactly the same as mu naught times epsilon naught. So the speed of light is actually determined by the permittivity and the permeability of free space. So those are constants relating to electricity and magnetism. They tell you how strong the field is going to be. And they actually, they're different in different media. But we're just talking about a vacuum. And to a good approximation, air acts as a vacuum. So the speed of light through air is very similar to the speed of light through a vacuum. This is not the case for water or for diamond or for crystals or different media. Uh, the speed of light is actually going to be quite different in these, in these media. It's going to slow down, usually. So we've got the, all, all of Maxwell's equations in free space at the top. Now what else do we need? Well, we need this vector identity. So this vector identity says that the curl of the curl of any vector field v, v is some general vector field, the curl of the curl is going to be equal to the gradient of the divergence minus the Laplacian. So the Laplacian is represented by the little del operator nabla, as it's sometimes called, a little square on top. So this is summing up all the second derivatives. This is some kind of operator that acts on the vector, and it sums up all the second derivatives, uh, and they're all partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So that's what the Laplacian does. What about this? This over here is the divergence, and then we're taking the gradient. And if you know that the Laplacian is actually the reverse of this, it's the opposite of that. So this vector identity holds. So we're going to assume this is true. This is one of the vector identities you can look up. And we're going to use that to prove, uh, actually to derive, the electromagnetic wave equation. So first of all, we have two vector fields, right? the electric field and the magnetic field. So let's put those into this vector identity instead of some general vector v. So let's start off by putting the electric field in there. And if we put the electric field in here, what's going to happen? Well, this term is going to vanish because the divergence of the electric field in a vacuum is 0. So this term disappears. And that means that this condition implies that the curl of the curl of the electric field is minus the Laplacian of the electric field. And the exact same condition holds for the magnetic field, right? Because the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. It's zero in a vacuum, and it's zero in general because there's no magnetic monopoles. So what we have is the curl of the curl of the magnetic field is minus the Laplacian of the magnetic field. So now we have these two expressions. But what do we want to do? We want to set this expression for uh, the magnetic field and this expression for the electric field equal to something else. So what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate the curl of the curl of both the electric and the magnetic fields. And we're going to get two separate expressions. And we're going to set them equal to this. So now let's have a look at all of this stuff that's written in blue. First of all, let's have a look at this top blue line. So what do we have? We have the curl of the curl of the electric field. So we're trying to find something that's equivalent to this. We want something that's equivalent to minus the Laplacian of the electric field. How are we going to do that? 
Well, we can actually use some of Maxwell's equations over here. We've already used the two of Maxwell's equations that deal with divergence. Now we're going to deal with the ones that have curl, right? The curl of the magnetic and the electric field. So first of all, we've got a curl of the electric field inside here. What is the curl of the electric field? Well, Faraday's law of induction tells us that the curl of the electric field is minus the time derivative, it's a partial derivative with respect to time, of the magnetic field. So we can actually just swap these out because they're equivalent. We can put this inside here, right? So we've got this guy sitting inside here. Now what we can do is, this is something we're gonna use in a lot of these steps, we can actually swap the order of these operators. So time derivatives and then taking the divergence or the curl, we can actually swap that stuff around. And we can also move constants in and out as we need. So it's nice that nature has been kind to us and it's allowed these properties, this commutativity of these operators uh, to work, right? Because this actually describes reality. In, in general, this may not work. You might have some kind of uh, mathematical description of a, a system where you can't actually swap derivatives and other operators around. But luckily for us, classical electromagnetism works very nicely. So we, we are allowed to actually move this curl inside the time derivative. So we can take the negative, side out, uh, the negative sign outside, and we can take the partial derivative with respect to time outside as well. And now we have a different expression, which has the curl of the magnetic field. So over here, we're dealing with the magnetic field, but we want something in terms of the electric field. How do we go back from the magnetic field to the electric field? Well, we have a look at Ampere's law. Ampere's law in free space. So what's it going to be? Well, it's just this, right? These two guys are equivalent. The curl of the magnetic field is 1 over c squared times the partial derivative with respect to time of the electric field. So now we can substitute this guy into here. And have a look at this. We can ha now take this constant outside because of the property of linearity. Differentiation is a linear operation. We can take this guy outside, and we also have a negative sign here. And then we can apply the time derivative twice. And if you apply the derivative twice, what do you get? You get the second derivative with respect to time. And again, it's a partial derivative because there's other variables. There's other dependencies. There's dependencies on x, y, and z, which are the spatial coordinates. So that is actually equivalent to this over here, right? Because both of these guys are equivalent to the curl of the curl. The curl of the curl is negative to the Laplacian, and the curl of the curl is also negative 1 on c squared times the second partial derivative with respect to time of the electric field. So we'll come back to this in a second. Now let's do the same thing for the magnetic field. Let's take the curl of the curl of the magnetic field. What's that going to be? We're going to use the same procedure, just we're not going to use uh, Faraday's law first. We're going to use Ampere's law first. So we're just going to use a different ordering. So instead of the curl of the magnetic field over here, we can actually swap it out by just substituting Ampere's law. Then we can again change the order of these operators. We can move this constant out, outside because 1 on c squared, that's just a constant. Then we can move the time derivative outside, move the curl on the inside, and now we have the curl of the electric field. So with the curl of the electric field, what can we do? Well, we can use Faraday's law. And Faraday's law tells us that this is negative, the partial derivative with respect to time of the magnetic field. Now we can again use our trick and move this negative sign, which is just a constant, right? Negative one is a constant. We can move that outside, and we can apply the time derivative again to give us the second derivative with respect to time. And again, it is a partial derivative. So you can see we have the same form for the electric field and the magnetic field. So what, what has happened over here? We have turned the electric field into the magnetic field, and then we've turned the magnetic field back into the electric field. And in the second line, we did the opposite. We started with the magnetic field, we turned it into the electric field, and then we hopped back to the magnetic field. So on, on this side, we have the same field as we do at the end. Right? We just move into the other one and then come back. And how do we do that? Well, we use these two laws, Faraday's and Ampere's law, which are the third and the fourth of Maxwell's equations. So for the top step, we use the divergence uh, equations, which are Gauss's law for electricity and Gauss's law for magnetism. And then for these second two uh, manipulations that I've got written in blue, we used the, the expressions that use curl. 
which are Faraday's and Ampere's law. Now what can we do? We have two different equivalent ways of writing the curl of the curl of both the electric and the magnetic field. So we can now set them equal to each other. Uh, as I was saying before, for the electric field, the curl of the curl of the electric field is equal to this, and it's equal to negative the Laplacian of the electric field. So we can set this guy equal to that guy. And I've got that written over here in red. Then what we can do is we can do exactly the same thing for the magnetic field. We know the curl of the curl of the magnetic field is negative of the Laplacian of the magnetic field. What do we also know? We know that it's also the negative of 1 over c squared times the second partial derivative with respect to time of the magnetic field. So we know that this is equal to that. And both of these guys have negative signs. Notice how we didn't start with a negative sign, but we accumulated a negative sign uh, in this manipulation. Over here, we accumulated the negative sign immediately in the first step. And over here, it took us a few steps to accumulate the negative sign. Where did that negative sign come from? It actually came from Faraday's law because of this negative sign. And that's sometimes expressed as Lenz's law. And Lenz's law tells you the uh, direction of the circulation for an electric field when you have a changing magnetic field. So Lenz's law is actually encapsulated within this rigorous uh, representation of Faraday's law. So now we have this expression. And what we can do is we've set these guys equal to each other because the negative signs can just cancel out. If the negative of something is equal to the negative of something else, then the positive versions are also equal. So we have these two expressions. Now we can just move the Laplacians to the left-hand side, and we have this standard form for the wave equation. Right? This is the standard form that you may recognize uh, back when you were doing things like waves on a string. Right? Waves on a string, they satisfy this. But waves on a string, because a string is one-dimensional, only have one uh, second derivative with respect to the spatial coordinate, which is sometimes x. Right? You just label it as x. There's only one spatial coordinate in a one-dimensional spring. But over here, we have three spatial coordinates. There's x, y, and z. And you can put it into different coordinate systems like spherical or cylindrical coordinates. And it will also work, but you'll, again, have three spatial coordinates. And time is kind of treated like a spatial coordinate. But it's just got this factor of 1 over c squared. Isn't that peculiar? Time acts kind of like a spatial coordinate. So why have I written this form over here? This is called the de Lambert operator, or sometimes the de, de Lambertian. The, the Lambertian is an operator in special relativity, and it takes electromagnetism, and it makes it work for special relativity. So you can see that time is actually behaving very, in a very similar way to space. Because if we expanded this out, we would get partial derivatives, and it'd be second order partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. But those guys wouldn't have 1 on c squared out the front. So these guys all act together and they form this little box operator. I uh, just want to, to clarify that sometimes people like to write a little squared symbol over here. And both of those are standard notations that you'll see. I think this one is one of the more common ones that you'll see in a lot of sources. But some sources have variations on this. Some sources even use triangles. But I think one of the, the reasons a square was chosen to represent this operator, the de Lambertian, is uh, because you have four dimensions in space-time. You have one temporal dimension, which is the time dimension, and then you have three spatial dimensions. So you can see that classical electromagnetism is actually somewhat consistent with special relativity. And that is an amazing uh, consequence of Maxwell's equations. So I'll give you a quick summary of what we did in this video. We took Maxwell's equations in a vacuum, in a free space, where there's no charge. We modified Maxwell's equations in general to get these uh, modified versions of Maxwell's equations that fit the free space condition where there's no charge. Then we used this vector identity, which is the curl of the curl of any vector, is the gradient of the divergence of that vector minus the Laplacian of that vector. So we used that vector identity, we took that for granted, and then we applied that with a bunch of these conditions. We combined these guys, we smush, smushed them together, and we actually got the wave equation for both the electric and the magnetic field. So these wave equations predict electromagnetic waves. And then we also talked a bit about how this links in with special relativity. Special relativity is actually consistent with electromagnetism. So as a final remark, 
I want you to think about these two equations. This is the takeaway message from this video. We started with Maxwell's equations in a vacuum. We used a vector identity. We manipulated all of these equations, and we got these two guys out of it. So anything that is a wave in, that's propagating in 3D space, that is actually going to satisfy this. And what is an electromagnetic wave that propagates in 3D space? Well, example is light. So light is actually electromagnetic waves. Electric uh, waves uh, or perturbations in electric fields can cause perturbations in magnetic fields, and they can constantly feed each other back and forward. And that is actually what an electromagnetic wave is. So an electromagnetic wave is essentially light, where light is explained by Maxwell's equations, or optics and all of light is an electromagnetic phenomenon. So uh, try and do this derivation yourself and try and get all these ideas to sync up. I know it looks a bit intimidating, it kind of looks like hieroglyphics, but it, it's a good exercise to try and do this derivation by yourself.